All right, I'm here with Mark Schatzker. He's an award-winning writer, author of The Dorito Effect, and this newest book, The End of Craving. Mark, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much for having me on. Super exciting. Uh, like I was telling you offline, I've been following some of your work since The Dorito Effect, and uh, it was a book that really blew my mind, especially as a health coach and someone who works with a lot of weight loss clients. And I really was, uh, and I'm thinking if we could just kind of Talk a little bit about that book because I, I feel like I could do a whole interview on you just the Dorito effect, but I know we're going to talk about end of craving today. But maybe you could just kind of tell the audience about about the Dorito effect and what I know I was left with after reading that book is like, oh my God, like there are these these chemicals, these flavoring, these flavor profiles that are so intricate. And then it's almost not even fair that like the way like humans are being rigged against this system uh, of the big food industry, and and how it affects that the way they eat. And so I'm just wondering, yeah, if you can kind of just talk talk a little bit about the Dorito effect and maybe some of the biggest takeaways for people that haven't read that and why that led you to now the your latest book, End of Craving. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so the Dorito effect is a book about flavor and how the flavor of our food has changed. And what started that book was my first book, which was about steak. And that was just very simply a travel book. I traveled the world searching for the best steak. Great book to write. Had a fantastic time. But what I found I is that- I bet you did. <laughs> what, a great, uh, what a great excuse to try every steak in the world, huh? Well, I could not believe no one had actually tried this before. So yeah, it was. Uh, I hit the jackpot as far as, yeah. you know, first book to write. Um, but what I found is that most of us are eating pretty mediocre steak. Um, we've gotten really good at producing a lot of beef, and it has come at the cost of quality. What I then noticed after that book is that this isn't the, just the story of steak. This is the story of all of the food that we grow. Um, there's been a revolution, you know, the green revolution. We've gotten really good at producing a lot of food, and, and there's many good things to this. We've got lots more mouths to feed, and we keep on building suburbs on prime farmland. So it's a good thing. Otherwise, we'd be starving. However, yeah. it has come at the cost of quality. So then I started to look more and more at this idea of flavor and how we enjoy food. Because we are all kind of locked in this nutritional paradigm. We get into arguments about fat and carbs. And we, it's like we are all nutritionists. But, but the, the truth is, we don't approach meals that way. Like even if you're on a diet, you buy the book that has the 25 most delicious, irresistible, awesomest recipes for whatever diet you're on. Yeah. So the enjoyment of food is what we're really all in for. That's why we go to restaurants, that's why we have favorite restaurants, favorite recipes. And yet we never talk about this. What is flavor? So the Dorito effect basically chronicles two really alarming trends in food. And the first is that the wholesome food is getting blander. But then we find that processed food is getting more and more flavorful. And this comes back to the invention of a device called the gas chromatograph in the 1950s. This lets scientists peer inside food for the first time and, and just discover these, these compounds that exist in food in tiny quantities, parts per million, parts per billion, even parts per trillion. That, that gives us the sense of flavor. And as soon as we discovered these compounds, we started producing them in factories and we put them in all sorts of foods. So while we're having this discussion about carbs and fat and sugar and calories, companies are putting these flavor compounds in food that make them irresistible. So the Dorito effect, I, I talk about the invention of the Dorito. The first ever Dorito was just a salted tortilla chip. It bombed. What made it this snack that people, it, it's famous, um, one of the most successful snack foods of all time, and a snack that notoriously you can't stop eating, was the addition of taco flavorings. Now, did those first Doritos taste exactly like a taco? Of course not. But they had that zest, that zing, that depth of flavor that made this chip that people didn't want to eat all of a sudden can't stop eating them. This is the power of flavor because in terms of nutrients, it was the same chip, same amount of oil, same amount of corn, carbs, salt. It was the flavoring that did it. So that book was really a plea to get everybody to start taking flavor more seriously. Yeah, yeah. I mean... And these 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 um, food scientists, I mean, they're making also chemo the some of like the profiles that they're making, right? I mean, would you say too? It's like they're making profiles or even sugar compounds that are just beyond what we could ever naturally get from like you know the sweetness or or even like the profile of just normal food, right? And I feel like because of that, it's that is really it's like a trip. I mean it. It's that's why I kept saying it's we're like almost rigged like against us because you you could never in natural in a natural environment or nature get some of those profiles, but they're creating that in food. And so then when you go back to have regular, you know, quote unquote, regular food, you're like, this tastes terrible. Like my taste buds 
don't like this. I want the sugar. I want the sweeter thing. Or yeah, and and, and it doesn't help that that regular food has is kind of disabled by the fact that it's all getting so bland. The, the bigger concern for me is is what I call the nutritional context of flavor. So I asked a question in that book that we amazingly never ask, which is why does food have flavor? It's a really important question because we have this amazing flavor sensing device in the middle of our face, the nose and mouth. Flavor is a combination of the aroma of food that you sense as you eat it and the taste that you experience with your tongue. If you look at your DNA, the thickest chapter is on making your food sensing equipment, and yet we're all having this abstract discussion about calories and, and so forth. The interesting thing is you ask, well, why do we have this flavor sensing ability? Why does a carrot taste like a carrot? And why doesn't it taste like an apple? Why does chicken taste like chicken? Why does a hot dog taste like a hot dog? It's because your brain associates the chemicals it can sense, these aroma and taste chemicals, with the nutrients that it senses as it metabolizes food. So if you look at something like a tomato, science has shown us that the flavor compounds that really drive a tomato like and that make this tomato taste awesome, they're all synthesized from essential nutrients in a tomato. So you can consider the flavor of a tomato being like this big sign saying to your brain, hey, there's really healthy stuff here, you should eat me. Well, this works beautifully in a state of nature where tomatoes taste like tomatoes and better tomatoes taste better and are better for you. What then happens if we capture these tomato flavors in a bottle, we analyze them, we start cranking them out in a factory, and we put them in ketchup-flavored potato chips? All of a sudden, you've got this flavor profile of a tomato that your brain goes, yeah, this is, this is supposed to be good, right? But now the nutritional context is totally different. Now, instead of getting fiber and vitamins and, and minerals and antioxidants, you're getting fat and carbs. Um, so I think this is really where it gets alarming is it's really confusing your brain. We did not evolve to live in a food environment where there's essentially flavor chaos happening, but that is the environment we live in now. Yeah. Awesome stuff. And now, you know, and then that led you to your latest book, The End of Craving. What, what made you feel like I got more to write here? I got to, there, there's something still not left. Well, that... two things. The first was that in the Dorito effect, I realized that flavors, that this sensory technology was fooling the brain, but I knew it, it wasn't just a matter of fooling, that it must go deeper, that, that it's important to understand how the brain works to really understand why this is going wrong. But the second thing is, is what I really start to profoundly reject was this idea that we have that um, pleasure is bad. And, and people talk a lot about, you know, food being addictive or addicting. And there's this idea that if food tastes good, it must be terrible for you. And what I found is that there's certain food environments, I talk a lot about Italy in the book, where the food tastes incredibly good, and yet people are not a victim to it. So, so the truth is, so many of us are, we have this very disordered relationship with food. We're, we're victims of the food that we eat, but it's not particularly good food. I mean, that's the worst part of all. It's, yeah. it's bad. It doesn't actually taste that good. It has this hold over us. We're drawn to it, like magnetically, but it's not very good. Um, and I think within that, there's a really good news story, which is to say there are people who eat phenomenally delicious food and yet are not prisoners to it. And I think that is where we need to look for salvation because the way we're headed is not obviously not working. Yeah. Amen to that. You know, it's so interesting you say that because uh, our family, we try to eat as you know organic as we can and, you know, grass fed and that kind of stuff. But we be, because I have two boys and we, we, we just cook everything, it's just cheaper and just better food but yeah my wife and i it's like now like what you just said we we don't even really almost like to go to the restaurant because we find like her food is a lot better and we don't overeat it's nutritious and it's actually better quality we just eat at the house yeah no it's it's neat that you say that i have the same experience um uh, you know i get as much of the meat as i can get from farmers and and, and buy the highest quality produce and food tastes very different hey it, 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 it's it's easier to cook when your ingredients yeah. are better um that's that's one thing but i think what you're also keying on to is that the experience pleasure of food is actually complex we talk about deliciousness but the deliciousness of a dorito is really really different from the deliciousness of let's say a good glass of red wine or what i would consider a great steak one is just about sort of mindlessly putting the next bite in your mouth and the other is this sort of immersive experience of of deliciousness and also wellness and also the satiety after meal we never talk about that some foods like people almost joke about like the food hangover good food is not supposed to make you feel lousy that it's supposed to nourish you 
Yeah. Um, so this is something you understand, and I think it's important that more people understand that food is is actually like there's there's more dimension to this experience of eating and deliciousness and pleasure and satiety. And I think it's really important to develop that language and, and understand that because otherwise, it, it, that's that's one way to kind of break out of, of being kind of a victim of it. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the Italians uh, in just right now, and that was a great chapter, I thought, in your book. And I wonder if you could just kind of talk about it because you you illustrate, you're like, hey, we have these northern Italians who eat pork fat, uh, lots of cheese. Um, they drink their wine. They have their olive oil. They have all these things. And if you're looking at a macro for macro kind of comparison and you're looking at the northern Italians to like some southerner in the United States who's eating pork fat and sweet tea and all these things, well – their macros are kind of like lining up the same, but yet there is absolutely no obesity problem in Northern Italy, but yet we have that here in the Southern United States. So what's going on there? Yeah, the, um, Northern Italy is what really intrigued me. Um, for, for the following reason, we tend to think, uh, we have this long tradition of thinking that delicious food is dangerous. There's this idea, um, you know, if it tastes good, spit it out. Like, you know, keep it away from me. I can't control myself. So we think that, you know, it's, it's basically this delicious food that's taking us to a bad place. Well, Northern Italy is a really interesting place because it is, um, Bologna particularly is considered widely to be the culinary epicenter of Italy. That's controversial because Italy's, I think, filled with culinary epicenters. But the food in Bologna yeah. is insanely good. This is also a population that is obsessed with eating. They have a chamber of commerce where they have a repository of official recipes. They basically said as a group, we're gonna to get together and say, this is how you make lasagna. This is the one true way. This is the one true way to make tortellini. They have like 35 of these recipes they keep on adding to them. So th there's kind of a sense you would think of food obsession. Um, they have a kind of, it's almost like a religious group. It's called the Apostles of the Tagliatella. That is their favorite noodle. And they have these, these men who describe themselves as apostles. There's another group that worships tortellini, which is sort of like a ravioli, but sort of twisted differently. It's really interesting to look at pasta because what's it, what do you, how do you make tagliatella? With, with flour and eggs, it's carbs and fat. So they, they worship the two macronutrients that we've been like hair on fire screaming about for 20 years. Um, you would think with this fixation they have on deliciousness, um, and, and it's it's not, I mean, this is not just their own opinion. Everybody loves to travel to Italy just to eat as they eat. Their gelato, if you've ever tasted it, you're like, wow, their ice cream just blows ours away. Yep. Um, how is it that they're not the plumpest in the world if their food is, is objectively so delicious? In fact, they're stunningly thin. The rate of obesity in Northern Italy, where they don't eat a Mediterranean diet, it's not all about grilled fish and legumes and olive oil. I mean, it's like pork fat, uh, salumi, salami, um, yeah. pasta, cream sauces, um, th they really don't look like they're watching their weight. Like you, you're absolutely stunned to see what they're eating. How could they be so trim? Their rate of obesity is less than 8%. We're over 42% here. It boggles the mind. So I started to really look at Northern Italy and say, well, what's different about this place? And I start to look back in time. And in fact, if you go back in time, there was a time when Northern Italy was very similar to the Southern US, um, both very poor, agriculturally backward and both had kind of a corn-based um, agricultural system and they were both suffering from a disease called pellagra it literally means um, rough skin in italian and for a long time nobody knew what this was it was it was raging in italy um, it was a, a, an epidemic and it would start with farmers they get like the, the, these skin scales the scales would spread they'd get diarrhea they'd lose their appetite they'd get demented sometimes they would do things like attack children there's a case of one guy cutting off his own genitals and throwing them out the window and it would resolve in death um, it affected women more than it did men they didn't know why they had uh, asylums but they, they just, they were like what the heck's causing this they had the strangest theories you can imagine they thought spores would get into the blood and burst into flame well, then in 1904, suddenly Pellagra appears in Georgia, and it is a pandemic because it spreads throughout the southern U.S. To, to the point that the southern U.S. is called the Pellagra Belt, and, and much like obesity, there was this rotating cast of experts that they all knew the answer. It's caused by sand flies. No, no, it's caused by uh, mosquitoes. No, it's caused by unsanitary conditions. Well, the discovery of the cure to Pellagra was a major advancement in our understanding of food. Um, an epidemiologist named Joseph Goldberger realized it had to do something with diet. Nobody would listen to the guy at first, but he could cure it by getting people to eat different things. He even caused pellagra by getting a bunch of prisoners and feeding them the Southern diet. Um, 
And he even would have like a filth parties where he would take like, like, like the bodily fluids of people suffering from pellagra and, and make a dough out of it. He fed it to his wife. He fed it to himself. His the people who worked with him, they didn't get pellagra. Finally, people realized this guy's right. And eventually we discovered the cause that there was something, some kind of essential element in food that you need just to live. If it's not there, you're going to die. And we eventually realized this is what we now call niacin or vitamin B3. And, um, this changed our understanding of food. We, we, you know, this changed our understanding of nutrition, that food isn't just food, that it's made up of, of various different chemical constituents, which are essential to life in different ways. But what's so interesting about this experience of pellagra in these two different countries is how they responded to it. Um, because the American response was to say, okay, well, clearly we see here there's something wrong with food because food can be food, but it doesn't nourish you. And there's something wrong with us because we don't know what's good for us because here's all these southern farmers eating you know, this diet that's making them sick. So the response was to blast, pass the enrichment laws. In the early 1940s, uh, the American government passed laws that technically encouraged but basically made it the law that uh, refiners and millers of, of, of flour had to start adding B vitamins. They added niacin but also riboflavin and thiamine and also iron. First, it was just to white bread, but then it just made its way into all of our processed carbs. It's in donuts, it's in rice, it's in corn flour, it's everywhere. And it had, I mean, it was just remarkably successful. Overnight, pellagra is just gone. Poof. It, it just worked so beautifully. Over in Italy, it, I mean, the response was almost hilarious. It was like a bunch of peasants. They said, well, I guess farmers, maybe they should... Um, they should bake bread in communal ovens and, and they, should, they should grow rabbits because rabbits are, you know, a cheap and easy form of meat to raise. And some people even said they should drink wine. And you're just like scratching your head like, guys are such <laughs> morons. These people have a nutritional deficiency and you're saying, you know, have a glass of vino? Actually, it wasn't bad advice. They didn't know the reason, but the wines back then weren't particularly well filtered. They had lots of yeast. And guess what? Yeast is like packed with niacin. So if someone had pellagra, giving them a glass of wine was actually a pretty good idea. But here's what's so interesting about that Italian approach. It worked. Didn't work as quickly, but Italy ate its way out of a nutritional epidemic. Well, now look at these two countries and look at how different they are. These two parts, the, the pellagra belt in the US is now the obesity belt. It's now the diabetes belt. It went from one nutritional disaster to another. And, and you look at that history and you think, well, we're, we're cursed because you're either going to starve and then once you have enough food, you're just going to overeat. Like, like there's just no balance with the human. We're programmed to self-destruct when it comes to eating. Then you look at Northern Italy and you're like, whoa, hold on a second. These guys are eating food that's just astonishingly, awesomely delicious. Mm -hmm. And yet they're so much thinner. Well, look at these two responses because the view in the US was food is imperfect. We are imperfect. Let's use the, the, the impartial hand of science to improve food and, and you know, suppress our internal nature. Um, uh, Italians, they didn't see food as the problem. They said, food is the solution. These farmers are too poor to eat a proper diet. So let's enable them to eat a good food. And that's what Italians eat. And they have such a culturally different understanding to this day of food. They prize food. They have laws, DOP and DOC, which is essentially, these are laws saying, if you want to call these tomatoes San Marzano, it's got to be a certain variety of tomato and you got to grow it this way in this area. And if you don't, you can't call them that. And they have these rules for all sorts of different foods. We kind of think, oh, isn't that cute? You know, isn't that interesting? Isn't that adorable? It works. I mean, their relationship with food is so much better than ours. What we've been doing is for a hundred years, we keep on improving food. It started with fortification and enrichment, but we have artificial sweeteners. We have fat replacers. Um, we have flavorings. We keep thinking we can do a better job of making food than mother nature. And my assessment is that's false. We can't. And it's taking us to a very bad place. Yeah, there's this there's this part in the book too where you, I think you ask a an Italian chef, you ask him like, "Hey, like why, you know, what is like one of the what what is so different between like Americans and and Italians?" And he says he kind of like paused and then answered you and said, "Well, we like actually cherish the the experience of food." Whereas yes. you guys just like eat to eat, like it's just like a thing, like, "Oh, yeah, I'm just going to eat." Like and I and just that idea of like we're on the go, we're going somewhere, and you're just jamming something in your mouth just so that it can you can get to the next place. Whereas an Italian, it's like, and I've been to Italy, I studied there for three months, it's like, 
no, uh, this is this is an experience. Like we're gonna have six piatti. You're gonna sit down. You're gonna have you know a salad, a risotto. It's it's a, like there's like six different courses before you finally get to the very final one. Like that's a, a meal. And so hearing him say that, like what what you're just talking about, wow, like what a different experience when it comes to surrounding food, you know. Well, and one of the most interesting pieces of data I came across is that if you look at Italians, you can also, this also applies to the French, they eat on average a lot fewer calories than we do, like substantially fewer. That's why they're a lot thinner. And yet it takes them like almost twice as long to consume those calories. It doesn't make sense. It's like, it's like if it took you longer to see the same movie as me, you're like, well, how does that work exactly? <laughs> but their meal experience is just profoundly different than our own. Um, and it's, it's so funny when you go there, they even think things like, why would you want a cup holder in your car? Because, um, because you should be enjoying that coffee, um, you know, not, yeah. not, not s s sitting there mindlessly drinking it. And I think it's, it's a really good point. Like you say, you, you go to an Italian restaurant, you see the courses and you're like, are you guys nuts? Like, are you trying to make yourselves fat? There's like four courses. Like the pasta is a, a preemie. There's first there's the antipasto and then there's the pasta. It's a preemie. Like we're going to have something else after we've had yeah. pasta, which is supposedly like deadly and addictive and all that. And yet, yeah. man, they're doing great. Yeah. You, there was something I wrote down, too, in the book, and you said, uh, talking about that whole idea of enriching and fortifying our foods with B vitamins, now, you would think this would be a good thing, like you're, like you're talking about the whole pellagra, but you said with great obesity comes great B vitamin intake. Why are these B vitamins causing us to be fat? Yeah, th that's a great question. So, so yeah, because so the first difference that I talk about is this sort of metaphorical difference in terms of one culture thinks food is deadly, the other culture thinks food is wonderful. But then the other thing I've looked at is, you know, what if there's more to this B vitamin thing than meets the eye? You know, what if in the short run it cured pellagra, but what if in the long run there's something else going on? And that gets us to the point of what is the point of vitamins? You know, we have this idea that calories are deadly and vitamins are like the forest elves of nutrition. They're just, they're just implicitly good and wonderful, the more than the better. This is a naive tr view. The truth is you're gonna die without calories. Most of us consume too many, but if you don't get calories, you're going to die without a question. Um, but the other point is that they're, they're kind of entangled. Um, you need vitamins to metabolize calories. And this is the interesting thing about that Southern diet. Remember I talked about how these, these Southern farmers were, were dying of pellagra? The diet they were eating was insanely rich in calories. The, the pellagra diet was grits, which is corn flour, mixed with pork fat and molasses. Can you think of a more calorie rich diet? You've got carbs and fat and sugar, and yet they're starving from it? That doesn't make sense. Well, it does make sense when you understand the metabolic role of niacin. Like many, but not all, but most of the B vitamins, it's involved in energy metabolism. So here are these poor farmers consuming like calorie, 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 and yet they're starving. Why? Because a calorie isn't a calorie. It's not usable without the vitamins that make it usable. So this is important because we often think of ourselves as machines and we think like, oh, well, calories are like energy. It's like plugging your vacuum cleaner into a wall or like putting gasoline in your engine. And, and that's actually not a good way of thinking about it because we also need the micronutrients to support calorie metabolism. So I knew there was something going on with this. And wh where I found the gold was, was looking at pig farming in the 1950s. Because pig farmers back then, they wanted to get their pigs in and out quickly as farmers do now. The, the, the faster you can get them up to weight, the shorter the time you have them, the more money you'll make. So farmers back then knew that there was like a rocket fuel f uh, feed combination, which was corn with some soy. But they also knew if that's all you're gonna feed your pigs, well, they're gonna gain weight for a bit and then they're gonna crash because they get like the pig version of pellagra or some other nutritional deficiency. It's not a balanced diet. So they didn't know why, but they knew you can feed them this corn and soy. You also gotta send them out to pasture to eat alfalfa or you gotta bring them green feed. They need to get their veggies, otherwise they're gonna die. The, the diet needed to be balanced. Well, the discovery of vitamins changed farming forever. We talk a lot about confinement farming, feedlots, CAFOs. None of that would be possible without the discovery of vitamins. Because when, with the discovery of B vitamins, the animal scientists realized like, hold on a second. Turns out you can, you can keep this pig in like this little cage, it can barely even move, and you can feed it corn and soy, and then you dust in these B vitamins. It doesn't need to eat alfalfa anymore. So now it's on this rocket fuel feed and that just changed pig farming because they look at the growth curve and they're like, whoa, that's insane. What kind of idiot would send his pig out to eat alfalfa when you can just stuff it full of corn and soy and add in the vitamins? 
So the, the goal of pig farming is to get your pig big and fat quickly. Well, the problem with humans is that we're all getting too big and fat too quickly. So I asked this question of maybe adding B vitamins to our processed carbs, a good idea in 1940 when people are, are starving from, uh, you know, dying of pellagra, not such a good, a good idea now when we have calories all over the place. And as, as the pig animal science showed us, calories aren't usable without the B vitamins. Well, now our food environment is filled with calories, but also we are dumping in the B vitamins that make those metabolically potent. And it's not just bread. We have um, voluntary fortification. So you look on the side of a cereal box, they're just dumping in all sorts of B vitamins because a mom looks at it and goes, oh, well, it's got all these vitamins. It must be healthy. My, my daughter brought home an energy drink from Starbucks, which had two, I think it was 200% of your daily requirement for, I think, vitamin, I think it was vitamin B6. And you, you're going like, well, why would someone need 200% of something? Like, but More I guess it, 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 people think, well, it, you know, it must <laughs> be twice better. as good as 100%. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, they play on our psychology. And the truth is this isn't good for us. So, so I think we need to take a deeper look at how we manipulate food because we're not as smart as we think we are. We're not these brilliant nutritionists who understand it all. Um, we've, we've mucked things up terribly and we need to look at why that's happening. Yeah. Along that note too, you have this great chapter on what you refer to as a nutritive mismatch, which kind of ties in with what you're talking about now. And that you even said like the brain, it cares about whether food is actually useful or not. And this kind of ties into those those fake sugars that we hear a lot about, the, the saccharins, the sucraloses, and all these things where, and, and maybe you can kind of talk about it, but it, the way I understood it is like, okay, you get this, you know, you go drink a Diet Coke or something because yeah, that's, you don't want to get the calories. That'd be terrible, right? But you're confusing your brain when you're doing that. Your brain is like, oh, this is sugar but it's not getting the actual calories that it's expecting from this sugary drink that it's supposed to get because that's what it tastes. It's tasting sugar, but it's not getting it. And so can you kind of explain how that is like really causing us to um, like kind of cycle out? I mean, and people are starting to, they're going out of control and what it, what it does to the brain in the future. Yeah. Um, you know, th the reason we have all these little, you know, techno tricks that we add to food is because our view is that basically we're kind of like the appetite was forged in the stone age when calories were scarce. And we're just these sort of ogres. We just have this appetite. We just want to stuff our faces. And we think, well, we're going to use that really smart part of our brain to fool the dumb part of our brain. So we're going to, we're going to make our brain think it's eating, you know, these sweets and stuff that you stupid idiot, but I'm going to actually just kind of quietly slip you some sucralose or aspartame. And you're not going to know the difference because you're an idiot. Well, it turns out our brain is actually, this, this eating part of our brain is way, way smarter, way more nuanced and intelligent and sensitive than we think. So I'll tell you by way of an experiment, um, a scientist, um, professor at Yale, Dana Small, she wanted to see, you know, is it possible to create drinks that are just as rewarding, but have fewer calories? So this idea that we can, we can keep in the sweetness, um, but lower the calories. So the question is, how do you test that? And, and this is what makes Dana Small a great scientist. She came up with a really interesting way. She created five different drinks that all had their own flavor and color, but she used the artificial sweetener sucralose so that they all tasted equally sweet. They all tasted like they had about 75 calories worth of sugar. She used that, this fake sweetness to create this identical sweetness across them. Then she used a tasteless starch called maltodextrin to give each drink a different calorie payload. I think it went like zero... Um, I think 30, 35, um, 75, 112, and 150. So, so basically you've got these five drinks, all equally sweet, one super caloric, one on the other end, no calories at all, and all stages in between. She give these, gives these to subjects and they drink them. Um, their brains, you know, sense them. They sense the sweetness. Those calories get metabolized. And then she invites them back and scans their brains as they consume each of these drinks. Now let's just pause for a second and think, well, what are we going to see in those brain scans? Are, are all the drinks just going to be identical? Because the we just like sweetness. So if they all taste equally sweet, they'll all be equally rewarding, delicious, whatever word you want to use. Or is the brain in fact smarter? And it's going, no, 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 it's actually that 150 calorie drink that I like because it's calories that the brain wants because it's this, you know, ogre moron that wants to stuff its face full of calories. Well, it was really weird. The brain scans revealed it was the 75 calorie drink that really lit up the brain. And with the others, it was like not much was happening. 
That was really weird. This was not what Dana Small was expecting. So she then um, puts her subjects in what's called an indirect calorimeter. This is a device that measures what's called the thermic effect of food. So when you consume food and there's calories in it, your body starts processing those calories. That creates heat. So we can measure that heat and this thermic effect, the more calories you consume, the bigger the plume of heat. So one day a subject comes in, female in her 20s, she drinks the 75 calorie drink and there's this beautiful plume of heat Everything's going according to plan. This is great. She comes in a few days later and she drinks the 150 calorie drink. Well, according to the textbooks, there should be more heat produced because there are more calories. There's nothing. Like, it's like she drank a cup full of air. This is really weird. Dana Small's going like, oh my God, this makes no sense. And then it dawns on her, the number 75. Because the drink that generated the brain response and was metabolized properly was the drink that tasted like it had 75 calories but it also had 75 calories. So the taste matched the caloric payload. The other drinks were mismatched. The taste did not match the calories. Taste was in that case, a bad predictor of nutrition. So Dana Small calls this nutritive mismatch. The flavor, the taste doesn't match what you're getting. And this tells us that this experience of taste isn't like this frivolous, dumb thing from the stone age that makes us want to stuff our faces. It is information. Your brain wants to know what it's getting because it doesn't have like 40 minutes to sit there and metabolize a meal and say, well, should I have another bite or should I go seek a mate or kill the leopard or, you know, club my competitor to death? Um, flavor is information. And when we create foods that fool the brain, things go wonky because the brain doesn't know how to metabolize food. So this tells us two things. First, that flavor, taste, it's information. And secondly, that accuracy matters. And this casts a shadow over the last century of food processing technology because we've been creating all sorts of technologies that muck around with the flavor of food. Um, so this really changes the way we, we need to think about food because the part of our brain that eats, it doesn't read diet books. It doesn't look at that nutritional info panel. All it can do, it's like, imagine your brain is stuck inside your skull. All it can do is sense food. It senses food through taste and smell, and then when it metabolizes it. And we have been intentionally, excuse me, excuse me, intentionally creating food that lies to your brain. And we see now this has consequences. This is a really bad idea. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts, you know, too? And I was wondering, like, with some of these natural or just better alternatives to sugar, like stevia or stevia uh, monk fruit, like, I know those have that sweetness without the calories, but they're natural, like, from natural sources of flowers or plants. Um, do you think it's that's that, too, is still causing that nutritive mismatch? Yes, I do. Well? So, so people, I think they think stevia has kind of a halo around it because it comes from a plant. But, you know... Plants aren't out there. Like, it's not like a plant wants to hug you. You know, um, plants are loaded with toxins for one thing. Um, yeah. Being a herbivore is way more dangerous than being a carnivore. There's a really good chance you'll poison yourself. Uh, you know, people, foragers poison themselves frequently. They eat the wrong mushroom or the wrong, they're not technically plants, but you know what I'm saying? Um, so just because stevia comes from a plant doesn't mean it's somehow different. Um, you can get arsenic from plants. You can get all sorts of poisons. Um, you, the, also, we didn't evolve with stevia. I think it's from South America. Um, mm -hmm. It does the same thing. It, it creates the sensation of sweetness without the caloric payload. And I think that's the problem. So whether it's created yeah. in a lab, you can also create good things in a lab. It's not like laboratories are inherently evil and the force is inherently good. It's all a question of context. And what is this doing to my brain and my body? And, and, and what is the result? That's the question you have to ask. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about uh, dopamine. And, you know, you have a this kind of leads us into that idea, that craving that you're talking about, the end of craving. And y you do a great job in the book explaining, you know, this idea of dopamine and what it is in in terms of this anticipation, uh, the motivation for us to want to eat. And then but there's also this different part uh, of that pathway, and that's called dopamine you refer to as wanting, whereas there's another pathway in our in our brain called the liking, which is actually like enjoying the food and actually enjoying the moment we eat it. But can you kind of talk about this? You, you make a really good argument saying, hey, if you when you understand these dopamine pathways, like this is at the root cause of, of weight gain. Yeah, so, so it's important to talk about dopamine because for a long time, scientists thought dopamine was the pleasure neurotransmitter. And that leaked its way into popular culture. Science now knows that's not the case, but popular culture doesn't. So you'll hear people a lot of time talking about dopamine. They say, oh, your brain wants that pleasure hit. We gotta be really careful about that 
Dopamine's involved in what's called the reward system, but it is not what we think of as pleasure. This was discovered by a scientist named Kent Barrage, who he started out, who he, he initially thought that dopamine was pleasure. And what he found was, um, he just did these simple experiments. He would give rats a drug that would reduce dopamine in their brain and then, you know, squirt some sugar water in their mouth and they still liked the sugar water. They would like stick their tongue out and lick their paws. And he's like, that doesn't make sense. And then he lesioned their brains. He like wipes out the dopamine cells, it's gone. And they're in this like catatonic fog of this pleasureless existence. And then they still like the sugar water, what's going on? So then he does something else. He cranks up the dopamine. And now the rats are like voracious eaters, which you'd think, okay, it looks like pleasure, but no, because they're like making these like facial expressions. Like I, I can't control myself. I, I can't stop eating. And there was even evidence, evidence from humans because dopamine is also involved in movement. And Parkinson's disease is like a deficiency in the production of dopamine. So patients are given drugs that boost dopamine and they start doing weird things like they go on shopping sprees and they buy scratch cards and they go to casinos and they visit prostitutes and binge watch pornography. And yet they say like they didn't enjoy doing any of it. So like this really isn't making sense until Kent Barrage cracks the puzzle and he realizes what we thought, talk about as a pleasure is two different things. There's the motivational state of pleasure. Like I want that. I really want to eat that. I really want to get that. And this is really important from an evolutionary point of view. This is what attracts us to the things we need. But then when we eat food and we pop it in our mouth and we go, oh my God, that tastes amazing. That's not dopamine anymore. This is a different neural circuit. This is called the liking circuit. It's mediated by the opioids, more like heroin. If you, you know, dopamine is like cocaine and heroin and, and liking is like heroin if you want to get really crude about it. So when we talk about, um, you know, we, we often think that the problem with obesity is that people just, you know, they just indulge too much in the enjoyment of food. They don't have the good sense to say, I've had enough. Well, when you understand that pleasure looks this way and you take a good look at their brain, you see, that's actually not what's happening. If you were to say, compare the brain of a trim person with the brain of a, a person with obesity, and let's say it's all about the milkshake, everyone thinks, yeah, that obese person, they're gonna t sip that milkshake and go, ah, give, get all, you know, I love it, I love it, I love it. It's not what we see. It, it turns out what we call the pleasure impact of that milkshake, it's actually the trim person seems to like it more. If anything, the obese person, they're not getting that much pleasure from it, it's blunted. Where we see the difference is when they see the image of that milkshake. The trim person goes like, yeah, that looks okay. Wouldn't mind a sip of that. The obese person goes like, oh my God, I gotta have that. So what we see is that people with obesity, it's not that they enjoy food too much, it's that they want it too much. Something is making them want to eat more food than they need. And this is really important because this tells us our problem isn't that our food is too delicious. If that were the case, the Northern Italians would be the world's you know, biggest, fattest people. Our problem is we want food too much. And that's why we, we find ourselves unable to stop eating potato chips and eating, let's face it, fast food, which really isn't very good. Nobody would say this is like the apex of my you know, culinary experience was that cheeseburger ate in a freaking airport. It's not how it works. And yeah. yet we can't stop eating these foods. And I think this shines a light onto what's really going on and kind of the, the true nature of this, of this problem condition. Yeah. And then the, the other interesting thing too is when you, when you talk about this, the dopamine pathway and the liking and the opioid pathway, combining that with this nutritive mismatch, because, because our brain is getting the wrong signal about these calories and, it, and it's confusing the brain, it builds, you, you have this great chapter talking about how it builds uncertainty in the brain. And in times of uncertainty, that increases dopamine. And you, you, you were talking about these experiments where like a rat, and you would think in this super abundant time that like we live in right now where food is plentiful, you can get as much as you want. And they did experiments, I believe, and the, the rats that had the abundance of food actually didn't overeat. It was the rats that were given food like unpredictably. They didn't know when they were going to get their next meal. Those are the ones that continue to overeat because they didn't know when they were going to eat again. And because we're creating this uncertainty all the time, we are increasing dopamine. This is causing us to overeat. Is that kind of a, a fair assessment? Did I kind of recap some of what you... I think you did a great about? job. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that this realization that, that when we see, we, like I said, we look at the brains of people with obesity and see more wanting, more dopamine. So now we got to ask a totally different question. What's causing this? And it's really interesting when you look at the brain science of, of reward. Well, one of the best ways to produce more wanting to get the brain to really want something is to create what's called uncertainty. So you mentioned that experiment. It was, um, it was done in Scandinavia. I think it was Stockholm. 
with with mice and they put them in what's called a super abundant food condition and then they love sunflower seeds no it was gerbils pardon me um and there's like sunflower seeds everywhere some of them are sort of like packed in sand and some of them are just in a bowl just there eat them if you want them and the funny thing was in the super abundant food environment these gerbils didn't overeat you'd think they would have gerbils you know they're these dumb calorie craving morons just like we are even more so because they're like these rodents mm -hmm. well they didn't overeat in fact they seem to actually enjoy picking these sunflower seeds out of the sand it was like it was fun to do that and they would sit there and munch away on them well then they created this uncertain food environment where suddenly that big bowl of sunflower seeds is gone or it's filled with sand and they start to move the bowl around and it appears at different times and what happens these gerbils are like oh my god what's going on they just start to eat like crazy well here's the most interesting thing a bunch of interesting things um when they went to this uncertain food condition they suddenly stopped wanting to you know have fun digging the seeds out of sand now they're just going to that food bowl where they were, were how fast can i get them give them to me quick but here's the inter most interesting thing of all they always had too much food to eat the super f abundant food environment well the uncertain environment it didn't have as many sunflower seeds but there was still way more than they needed but because it suddenly became uncertain they couldn't predict it they went a little kooky so this tells us that prediction is really important to brains and a lot of neuroscientists they actually think of the brain as a prediction engine the reason we have these senses is so we can gather information about the environment and predict what's going to happen if i do this if i go here that's how we thrive we reproduce we have offspring well if you think of the sensed qualities of food taste flavor as information it's because your brain's trying to predict what it's going to get because it doesn't have time to sit there and metabolize the whole meal and you say, no is this good if it's good i should eat more of it or i should eat this much and then i should eat this well what happens to a brain when it starts to get information that is uncertain there's a technical term for this it's called reward prediction error which is basically the reward that the brain predicted didn't happen this is an error what does this cause most people would think well when something becomes uncertain i'm just going to lose interest in it because i can't rely on it that's actually the opposite of what happens what happens is we get extra motivated we go i really really want that why because in a state of nature um if something that you need becomes uncertain that means you might not get it and this whispers the potential of a loss well if that keeps happening with something as important as food you're going to die so when things become uncertain like like maybe you know uh there's a leopard that guards that tree from time to time you've got to work extra hard to get that fruit or you're going to die well what have we done to food we took let's just look at sweetness like in that dana small experiment the entire history of our species might have been hard to get sweet fruit but when you got that fruit it did not tell a lie the more sweetness it contained the more nutritious it was the more calories there were now we have taken sweetness and it could mean anything on a monday it could mean 300 calories on a tuesday that same signal could mean zero calories could mean 50 could mean 500 so the brain's getting a lot of reward prediction error and it's not just sweetness there's artificial flavors there are fat replacers which no one knows anything about they're more pervasive i would say than artificial sweeteners they're in everything they create this experience of rich caloric fattiness in the mouth and they deliver fewer calories what a great idea if your brain's an idiot what a terrible idea if your brain's actually really smart so we've created a food environment where flavor and taste just they're just all over the map it's chaos and what do we see brains want to eat more food why because we've created this uncertainty too much reward prediction error we've cranked up dopamine we've induced this this desire to eat it's uh, it, when you look at the brain science it tells us why this is happening yeah so amazing um all right so how do we fix this um <laughs> what do we do you you have um there's this uh, towards the end there's this chapter you talk about the binge eaters and um and how they ran some experiments you know we know so we know all these things about uh, the dopamine and the nutritive mismatch but at the end of the day people are still going to be stuck in this this craving loop so can you talk about a little bit about how people can prevent some of that that binge eating when, you, when we're talking about the the dark chocolate experiment and the the potato chips yeah so so m you know most of us think that if we want to lose weight um it has to be a state of, of kind of denying ourselves pleasure a kind of a permanent state of of of, of sort of just this gray bland existence of of denying ourselves the pleasures of eating um some of the most fascinating information and this book was filled with a lot of really interesting experiences but i visited a clinic in germany a woman named anya hilbert scientist who runs her clinic handles some of germany's most disordered cases of eating um and 
she has a really different take on pleasure than most scientists, as she thinks it's essential. She says, when you look at somebody with obesity, to just expect them, you know, food plays such an important role in their life, to just expect them to stop eating, not going to work. It, it's, it's actually cruel to even think that. Um, but what she found is, is this experience that we call liking, this can be used as a tool to diffuse wanting. So she found her, her binge eaters, um, she, she would tell them that when they got this desire to, to binge eat, and I mean, binge eaters will really just eat a spectacular quantity of calories in a very short time. She would say, instead of, of stuffing yourself, I want you to go and, and get the, the finest dark chocolate, finest chocolate you can afford and just put it in your mouth and, and, and have that instead. And we did an experiment and she showed me how this works. This was so interesting because it really acquainted me with these two different experiences of eating. We both call them pleasurable, delicious maybe. They're both very different. So we started with a bag of potato chips and she said like, look at the package, the flavor was cheese and onion. She said, open it, there, it made this pop, there was this whoosh of aroma and I wanted to eat them. And she said, you can, you know, you can pick out two chips and, and the chips just look pristine and wonderful. And she's like, you can nibble the edges. And then she said, you can rub them together. And I was like, that's weird, but I rubbed them together. And it was just astonishing. I wanted to eat those chips so bad, like it, it hurt. Um, and it made me aware that f there are foods that have been cunningly crafted that they really don't stimulate this liking circuit. Potato chips, you know, we don't really talk about, wow, there was that great bag of potato chips I had in 2003. <laughs> Um, in California, what a fantastic bag of chips that was. We never talk about it. And when you start to think, next time you have a bag of chips, think about it. You put a chip in your mouth, what is your next thought? It's like, well, once that crunch is gone, you're like, I want it, I want it again. So it's really just about this, this sort of vicious circle of reinforcement, just wanting to get the next bite. That's to me a very primitive way of eating. That's just sort of feeding, that is stuffing yourself. Well, the next thing she did, we, we put those chips away. She, I threw them out, I never even got to taste them. I just got this powerful sense of how badly I want to eat them. Then she gives us this little dark chocolate and she said, just let the heat of your body melt it. And at first nothing happened. I was like, what's going on? And then slowly it starts to melt. And then, and then there's this trickle of chocolate. And then my mouth just fills with this like warm coconuts. And, and then eventually there, I discover there's this like biscuit center that just gives out this resounding, wonderful crunch. And it was amazing. This little chocolate was able to provide me with so much pleasure. And she's seen in her own patients with binge eating disorder. It can, th this, this you know waterfall of liking can can put out this fire of wanting and i think that tells us something really important that food has to pleasure us on a deep level and in fact that maybe one of the tools in fixing what's wrong with food is actually creating real wholesome food that delivers true liking and i think this is very exciting because it tells us um, that actually the way out maybe isn't dismal and boring and painful but can involve some what i would consider the, the true joy of eating yeah I love that, and I thought, it w what a great experiment, and, and then just to show the data that it, that it works, and that I think it gives, like you said, a lot of hope for, I know, like a lot of my clients and people can benefit from that, that, hey, you can have a little bit of this, and if you can at least, um, you, like you said, that shower of liking can actually put out the damper of that anticipation, that dopamine surge that we really want, because that's what we're really chasing, and so once you have just a little bit, you can actually dampen that. So it's kind of cool. And I think what you can also do is mentally start to understand that some of these foods that think, you know, you're, they're your friend, they're not. I, I met one of uh, Anya Hilbert's patients and she was telling me how she looked at food differently. She, she talked a lot about cake and she said, you know, I realized like cake whispers these little, these, these, these promises to me that it never delivers on. And, uh, and she knows. So she's like, I might crave that cake, but I know it's not going to give me what I want. Ultimately, it's not going to deliver. And that has changed, you know, she has now a more rewarding experience with food because she knows what foods deliver and which ones don't. Um, and I think that's an insight a lot of us lack but could benefit from. Yeah, awesome stuff. Um, man, I think we cover a lot. I, um, I, I, I feel good about this. I, I want anything else that, you, uh, that I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Well, I just, I guess my, what I really want people to do is, is we just got to take, take off this white lab coat and pretending that we are these you know, nutritional analysts that, that can understand calories and vitamins and protein and start eating as we were meant to, which is to say, enjoy real food. Everyone says eat real food. I agree with that. But my message is eat like an Italian. Enjoy the food that you eat because that food is, is telling your body, body and your brain something real. Yeah, love that. 
I want to uh, ask you a couple uh, lightning round questions, and then we'll wrap things up. But before I do, any um, any exciting projects? That, I mean, you know, you just finished this book, but any what's anything new? Anything? Anything? What's well, what's next? Yeah, you know, we talked a little bit about the Dorito effect, and and I talked about something in Dorito effect called nutritional wisdom, um, which is this idea that we uh, that our cravings, our, our our likes, our dietary choices are in some way um, connected to our needs. So let's say if you need vitamin C, you might crave an orange. Well. That popular that theory was popular 100 years ago. It's sort of poo-pooed now. It's it's sort of seen as kind of woo and silly and mystical. Well, I think it's real. And I gave a talk at a scientific convention, and a scientist came up to me afterwards. This is in 2018, and he said that was a great talk. I think you're wrong. And then he said, Do you want to test it? So his name is Jeff Brunstrom. He's from the UK University of Bristol, and we spent the past few years testing this, and we've generated the first data in almost a century that shows, in fact, that our our food choices are connected to our need for things like vitamins and minerals. So, so that's exciting. And I think that tells us, you know, you don't necessarily need to buy those vitamin pills. You just need to eat wholesome foods that, that, you know, pack a good nutritional punch. That's exciting. I, you know, and that's, it's funny because I actually thought I had read in another book a long time ago talking about the hypothalamus will actually regulate that in the brain and the body in that if it's missing certain micronutrients, your brain will try to get that, obviously, from food. And, and maybe I even heard you on an interview um, talking about the same thing with phosphorus and, and you know, how uh, an animal will get maple – they know that phosphorus is in maple syrup. And so if they're missing that micronutrient, they might gravitate to foods like that. So I, I don't know. I wasn't too I'm, – I'm glad you did that experiment because that would make sense to me that it well it, 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 it makes a lot of intuitive sense but for various reasons science has, has sort of decided it, it didn't like that theory I think it's coming around now and the maple syrup thing you mentioned that was from an experiment but but where we see this in animals is is if um, you know cows become deficient in phosphorus they'll start to chew old bones so you're like well you know what did they read that in a book no yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so I think there's a lot of evidence and, and to see that it works that way with humans, I think, I think it's also important because it tells us if, if flavor is the cue for nutrients, all these flavors we're dumping in, in processed food, bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Um, you ready to jump into some lightning round questions and then we'll, Let's do just, it. we'll wrap it up. All right. Um, I'm curious, you know, what are, what are some choices that you think you made that made you who you are today? Um, I think following my curiosity, I, I've always just wondered about things. People say, well, how did you become a writer? It's like, because I was just really curious about things and I managed to figure out a way to get paid to, to you know, it's not like I'm paid lavishly. I don't drive a Ferrari or anything, but. Um, but you got I to follow... go try a lot of different steaks. I'll tell you that. That's right. I have eaten a lot of steaks. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so I followed my curiosity. I wanted to get answers to the questions that I thought were important. And, and fortunately, some other people have thought those are important questions too. Yeah. Amazing. You know, you're doing such amazing work, obviously, in the health and wellness world and just in the writing world. Uh, I'm curious, you know, who inspires you? You know, every time I read what I consider to be good writing and what I consider that is essentially the power of observation to, to be able to describe the life that we all experience, but put it into words that capture it. So um, I think there's some writers that do a really good job of that, whether they're whether it's a memoir, whether it's fiction. Um, whether it's travel writing or science writing. And I, I hope I can even do just a, a fraction of as good a job as they do. Yeah. I'm a big reader. Uh, obviously, I got, I got your books. Um, but I'm curious, any any books that um, that inspired you, that just had a lot of impact in your life that you'd recommend someone else go ahead and read as well? Um, I, you know, it's funny. I'm a big fan of Bill Bryson, and he does a lot of travel writing. And a lot of people consider his writing light because he he is such an effortless craftsman of, of prose. But I think I think that effortlessness, you know, it hides a great deal of effort. I, th I think he's an excellent writer. Um, uh, his book, A Brief History of Everything, is is outstanding in terms of an ability to write about science in a way that is accessible. Um, so he, he's a writer I would recommend. There's a book called Pieces of the Frame. Um, a terrific book. That's one of the books that really inspired me. That's not by Bill Bryson. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think just, I just think, that, you know, you enjoy what you enjoy. And, and there can often be a lot of pressure to like read the books that are, are you know, literary or fashion or whatever. Uh, take it or leave it. Read the books that you enjoy. Yeah. Any, um, any rituals or, or hacks or practices that you do on a regular basis? That's an interesting question. Um, 
I try not to eat too much processed food. Um, I just find that sometimes, you know, these, these, these foods make you feel good in the moment, but you don't feel great afterwards. And I find that the longer you stay away from them, the more they lose their allure. So it can be maybe tough for people at the beginning, um, but with time, it gets, it gets easier and easier. Um, I guess my breakfast ritual, it's a, it's a, it's a hot cereal called Red River. Um, it's basically made with, um, with rye and flax and wheat berries and um, it, 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 it's gone off the market, but I figured out how to make it myself. I bought like this um, grain miller that I can attach to my KitchenAid um, stand mixer and I make it myself and it's delicious. I mean, if you want to get into the nutrition, it's got a boatload of fiber and all that, but I just find I start the day with that and I feel really good. That's great. You might have a, you know, you might have a new product right there. I mean, maybe, you know, you always, I always think of like entrepreneurship, you know, you're solving a need right there. They went off the market and you figure out a new way to make it. So yeah, exactly. Maybe I'll be looking forward to your, uh, your breakfast cereal. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Dorito effect breakfast cereal. Awesome stuff. Uh, Mark Schatzer, appreciate you, brother. Thanks for being on the show. Last but not least, where can, where can people uh, find you and, and your good work? Um, they can find, um, you know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, uh, I'm on Facebook. I don't really do a lot on Facebook. Um, and they can read the books, the Dorito effect, the end of craving steak. If they want to read about steak, it's, uh, you know, you can buy bookshops, Amazon. I hope, uh, I hope people read them and enjoy them. Awesome. Thanks for being on the show, brother. Thank you so much for having me.